So I'm delighted to be speaking to you as part of Spring Harvest this year, where you have this uh, slightly strange uh, title and theme, Flipped, uh, and you're looking at episodes and incidents in St Matthew's Gospel where Jesus upends uh, many of our expectations. Uh, it, said, it was said of the first Christians that they turned the world upside down. Well, actually, I don't think that's true. I, th I think they turned it the right way up. It's just we got so used to it being upside down uh, that when somebody puts it the right way round, it feels strange to us. You know, if, if you spend your whole life standing on your head, if somebody walks into the room on their feet, you think they're the old one. So anyway, I've got a bit of a, I've got several flips for you. Flip number one is I'm not going to be in Matthew's gospel at all. I'm going to be in Mark's gospel. Um, and I looked for a passage in Matthew that would say what I thought I wanted to share with you. And there were several I could have chosen, but the Mark one was much, much better. And as many biblical scholars will tell you, um, it's likely that, well, we think Mark is probably the oldest gospel, and it's likely that Matthew had a copy of Mark in front of him. So Matthew probably would have been familiar um, with this bit of the story that I want to share with you. And we're going to be looking uh, in Mark chapter 1, verses 32 to 38. Now, Mark's gospel is an action-packed gospel, and Mark chapter 1 is an action-packed chapter at the beginning of an action-packed gospel. An incredible lot of stuff happens all in Mark chapter 1. Um, it opens with the declaration that this is the good news of Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, it goes straight. We don't have a birth narrative in Mark. It goes straight into the baptism stories. Uh, then Jesus calls the disciples. We're still in chapter 1. Uh, then you get what I'm going to call a busy day in the life of Jesus, where lots of things happen and lots of people are healed. Jesus has a big impact and we pick up the story at the end of the very busy day in the action-packed chapter one of the action-packed gospel, verse 32, it's the evening. So Mark chapter one, verse 32, that evening at sunset, they brought to Jesus all who were sick or possessed with demons, and wait for it, verse 33, the whole city was gathered around the door. I mean, that's quite an impact, isn't it? The whole city was gathered round the door. We set the bar of our expectation high that this is uh, the impact of the presence of Jesus. People are drawn to him. People are gather around him. Note also, if we go on to verse 34, it says he cured many people who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. I mean, that's a bit of a footnote for this talk, but, but I simply point out, and you may want to ponder, uh, in Mark's gospel, it seems... Certainly, until at least halfway through the gospel, people don't know who Jesus is. Even though Mark's clearly told us this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, the Son of God, the Messiah. Um, uh, actually, only the demons really know who Jesus is. Anyway, I want to skip to the next morning. So that's the, uh, that's, that's, that's the first flip that I want us to consider. So... End of day one, busy day in the life of Jesus. The whole city is gathered round the door. Uh, we see the incredible impact of the presence of Jesus. Verse uh, 35, in the morning, so it's the next day. In the morning, while it is still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed. So, what is amazing and beautiful about this verse is we see in a single verse the absolute priority that Jesus gives to prayer, to time set apart, to intimacy with the Father. And for Jesus, prayer was not some sort of chore that he had to do, not an not a obligation or a duty. It seems as if it was joy for Jesus 
to spend time with the Father. And bear in mind, we're still in Mark chapter 1, which, as I said, also contains uh, the story of Jesus being baptised. And at his baptism in Mark 1 verse 11, there is a voice from heaven saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Many biblical commentators say that it is as if the whole of Jesus' life and ministry is sustained and shaped by the absolute, unconditional, complete affirmation of the Father's love and Jesus is endlessly renewing that relationship of love in the intimacy of prayer. So again, you will notice, and it's another bit of a flip in our understanding of the Gospel story, that there are many occasions where we find Jesus disappearing, uh, going off on his own, uh, spending time with the Father. He goes up a mountain, he crosses over to the other side of the lake, and here, very early in the morning, while it's still dark, he gets up, he goes off, he finds a deserted place, and there he prays. I mean, I think we need to pause and consider in our own ministry what is the priority we give to prayer, to, to time set apart? Has prayer become for us something just that we think we ought to do? Or, or perhaps, dare we ask the question, do we pray? Um, have we stopped praying? Uh, or do we just pray when we come to church or in other times of emergency? Has prayer become the rhythm and the heartbeat of our life um, as we find it in Jesus? So, verse 35, Jesus got up, still dark, goes to a deserted place, there he prays. I love the next bit. So the next bit, verse 36, Simon and his companions hunted for him. I, I love the way Mark uses the word hunted for him. Um, because as I say, this, this is a theme in Jesus' ministry. Jesus is often going off like this, um, avoiding the disciples, giving them the slip, going up the mountain, hiding in a deserted place. I mean, it's not that he wants to get away from them, but he does want to get to the Father. Um, also, here's a thought, particularly if there's any clergy uh, watching this. Uh, that one of the conclusions I draw from this piece of scripture is that Jesus wasn't an Anglican vicar. Um, because us vicars, who well, I'm a bishop, but I've been a vicar, um, we have this slightly weird idea, I don't know where it came from, that our job is to be always available to everybody all the time. And we kind of think that's the gold standard of vicaring, to be always available. Well, all I can say is that wasn't the case for Jesus. Um, Jesus placed a high, absolute priority on time sent, spent with the Father in the intimacy of prayer. It seems clear, therefore, that I should say, I don't always live it out, of course, but I should say, that the most important thing I do each day is say my prayers. And without my prayers, what is my ministry? So, this has happened, but of course, Simon and the other disciples don't get it. What they want is for Jesus to get back. There's, you know, the whole city was gathered around the door last night. There's more work to be done down in Capernaum. There are small children that need blessing. There are lepers that need healing and people who need raising up. There's lots to do. Where the blazes has Jesus got to? Oh, he's disappeared again. So they go off hunting for him. Verse 36. Verse 37 when they found him, they said to him, wait for it, everyone is searching for you. Well, again, if you are an Anglican vicar, or indeed any minister of any church listening to this, these are familiar words. Um, 
we all know what it's like, that everyone is searching for you. You know, you stand at the back of the church on a Sunday morning and a great crowd of people are around you, uh, not because of the wonderful impact of your ministry, though hopefully that will be the case with some of you, though obviously not with me, but they're around you because of what they want. You know, could you do this? Could you do that? I didn't like that hymn. Your sermon was too long. Um, there's everybody, or you come home, you know, and you switch on the computer and there's a flood of emails into your inbox. Um, everyone, everyone is looking for you. That's what Jesus experienced. That's what the disciples said to him. Verse 38, Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else. Now I love, I love this reply of Jesus. It is a flip. It is not what we expect. Jesus said, let's go somewhere else. I, I need to finish, I need to finish the, the sentence. He said to the neighbouring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. And then a very emphatic statement, that is what I came to do. Now there's a connection here. Uh, and let's examine closely exactly what's happening. Jesus really is upending the disciples' expectations, and I think if we're honest, perhaps our expectations as well. This is not quite how we imagine ministry to be. And at the heart of it is Jesus's incredible ability to say no. And the reason I believe that Jesus is able to say no to all that need back in Capernaum, which the disciples want to drag him back to, the reason I think he's able to say no is because he has a bigger yes inside him. And that bigger yes here is clearly the very heart of his ministry, which is the proclamation of the reign and the rule of God, the kingdom of God. And he needs to do that to the other neighbouring towns and villages. And yes, of course, his presence has a huge impact. The whole city was gathered there last night. And of course, there is great need. But amazingly, Jesus turns his back in this instance on that need because he is obedient to a higher agenda, to a higher calling. And where does that focus and purpose on the higher calling come from? Well, I believe it can only come from that intimacy with the Father, which is the heartbeat and the rhythm, the root, the foundation of his ministry. It's because he has set aside time to be with the Father that he is able, as it were, to refocus his life and ministry on that ministry's central purpose, which is both, of course, the declaration of the kingdom of God. And of course, the kingdom of God, kingdom of God isn't a place. I mean, the biblical vision is, of course, of the new heaven and the new earth, the kingdom, as it were, coming down to earth. But the kingdom of God, its boundaries run through human hearts. And Jesus' central purpose is both to declare that we have and can have community with God, and then through his dying and rising, to make that community possible. So it's an amazing little passage. Uh, it's not quite what we would expect. And it offers signals and patterns for our own lives and our own ministry. Because, of course, many of us find it very, very difficult to say no. Sometimes I feel with myself and some clergy I've worked with, indeed I've said to a few clergy, I've said, why don't you just leave your diary on the table at the back of the church and get the congregation to fill it in? Because you say yes to everything. And the only time you'd ever say no is because the diary's just be just literally become so crowded, there really isn't any room for anything else. Um, and the reason that many of us might find it hard to say no is because we haven't worked out how to say yes. We haven't worked out what is the big yes uh, that God is laying upon us with our limited time, limited resources, limited energy. So 
That is what I invite us to consider uh, in this seminar. How might and what might that look like in our lives to rekindle and strengthen the priority of prayer as that place where enjoying the intimacy and affirmation of God's love for us, we might also refine our purpose and begin to bring into greater clarity and focus the few things above all else that God is asking from us this day and in this season. And I believe if we did discover what is God's big yes for our lives, it would not only help us order our lives, not only make it a little bit easier to say no to some of the other pressing and important things that we could be doing, but I think it might also bring us rest, refreshment and joy. I had, um, I had a bit of a eureka moment on this, um, oh, many years ago now when I first became a bishop, and that in turn drew me back to a childhood experience. And I'd like to finish by by telling those two stories, which build on and illustrate what I see in Jesus in these verses from Mark. Um, so first of all, the childhood experience. So when I was about 12, um, I was a scout and we were at scout camp. Obviously, it's a, I'm old, this is a long time ago, and uh, children's lives weren't quite so regulated as they are now, and we hadn't quite entered the health and safety regime. So we all went a bit feral at times on this scout camp. And anyway, in the morning, we built what I think is called a zip wire. So we built like an A-frame. Uh, we ran a rope from a tree down to the A-frame. It had like a little trapeze thing on it. A rope ladder up the tree. You climbed up the tree, took hold of the trapeze, and then whizzed down to the A-frame where you, you know, where you sort of dropped off. And we built this thing and we played on it in the morning. It was great. In the afternoon, some other activity was happening in another part of the camp. And me and a couple of mates kind of, you know, sneaked off to have a play on the zip wire. I think it's called a zip wire. Um, so we, we get to this thing. And in my memory, it's kind of like 40 or 50 feet up. It probably wasn't that high. But to work, it's got to be pretty high for the thing to work. Anyway, a friend of mine climbs up the rope ladder to get hold of the trapeze. As he leans out to hold the trapeze, he, 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 well, he misses it and he, and he falls. And he drops and lands at, like, almost at my feet. His legs and arms splayed out around him. He's, as far as I'm concerned, he's dead. Um, uh, and it's completely shocking. So with my other friend who's there, we rush across the field and across the camp. We run to find the scoutmaster to come and, you know, you know tell him what, you know, it's, we're in panic. So, so we, we run across the field, we find the scoutmaster, but somehow we fail to communicate to the scoutmaster the urgency of the situation because we've run to find him and now we're, you know, we're kind of tugging him. He, need, he needs to run. This is an emergency, but he doesn't run. He just walks across the field and we're, I mean, I can't remember the details, but we're getting cross with him. You know, you've got to hurry up. You know, we think this boy might be dead or dying. Anyway, he doesn't, he doesn't run. Later that day, I mean, that evening, uh, he, he finds me and my friend and he sits us down and he talks through with us what had happened that afternoon. And he says to us, um, he says, when, when you came and got me, he said, I, I knew it was an emergency. I could tell before you opened your mouth, just the looks on your faces. I knew this was a genuine emergency. I, I think I also know that you were cross with me and perhaps still a bit cross with me that I didn't treat it in the way that you thought I should treat it, that I didn't run with you across the field, I only walked. And we, I suppose we kind of said, well, yes, yes. And he said, I just need you to know there are two reasons why 
I walked and didn't run. I mean, the first reason he said is because um, I have had first aid training, but actually, I mean, it may be true of many of you watching. I mean, I've had first aid training. Many of us will have had first aid training in relation to youth work or other activities we're doing, but how many times have you ever had to use it? Um, I mean, I've, had, I've done the training, but I've never, I've never had to use it. So now this is a real situation. And he said, as he walked across the field, he was walking because he, need to gather, he needed to gather his thoughts. Um, he needed to remember, what, what do I do in a situation like this? And I remember he said to me, he said, I, because I knew it was such an emergency, he said, I knew that my first action had to be the right action because there really might not be an opportunity for a second action. And then he said, the second reason I walked across the field and didn't run is because one of the first rules about giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation is that you can't give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to someone if you are out of breath yourself. And that's the bit of the story I haven't told you yet. My friend wasn't dead, but he was kind of unconscious. He was completely winded by the fall, as well as a couple of broken bones, but completely winded by the fall, and he wasn't really breathing. And the scoutmaster gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. He saved his life. That, for me, was a lesson in leadership. But, but not leadership as we often think about it. It was a leadership that dared, well, not maybe to stop, but dared to be still. In the midst of a situation of real horror and emergency, where somebody's life, you know, probably was at risk, where everyone else, me included, was rushing around. He dared to be still, to collect himself, to gather himself, to try to be sure that his first action was the right action. A, a, as it were, a big yes to knowing and doing the right thing. Second story, fast forward, years later, I've become a bishop. I'm sitting in a meeting uh, with the representatives from a parish where there's a vacancy for a new vicar. And we're sitting discussing what we're looking for in the, in the new priest we're going to appoint. And one of the church wardens utters those oft said words, well, Bishop, we're looking for someone who can hit the ground running. And when she said this, it was like something snapped within me and maybe somewhere in the deep recesses of my mind I was remembering that scoutmaster and, and his way of leading. And I found myself saying to her, I hope nicely, but I said, no, that's the last thing we need. The whole world is, you know, going down the pan because we've got too many people who hit the ground running. And the trouble with hitting the ground running is that you have all the satisfaction of movement and progress, but no guarantee whatsoever that you're going in the right direction. And if you're not going in the right direction, then hitting the ground running is really a dangerous thing to do because you're going the wrong way very quickly. No, I said, I think what we're looking for in this parish is someone who will hit the ground kneeling. Somebody who will dare to say, I'm not in charge, this isn't my church. Uh, someone who will dare to say, um, in order to discern the way forward, we're probably going to have to stop. We're going to have to make a renewed commitment to prayer. Uh, we must, before we move, discover what is God's big yes for this church, for our ministry, so that we may be obedient to God's purposes for God's church in God's world. I mean, a gardener wouldn't hit the ground running, would they? Um, 
I mean, that would be a really stupid thing to do. I mean, I mean, a really good gardener will say, well, the first year, I've just got to kind of look after what I've got because if I go and dig things up over there, that, that might be where the spring bulbs are. Um, and I don't know at the moment. And if I dig that bed, I, I might kill off all the bulbs that are going to come up next spring. So I, I need to wait, I need to watch, I need to tend. And, and then, it's not that we don't do anything. Ah, but, you know, you're ahead of me. You'll see where, see where I'm going. We need to lead like Jesus leads. Um, and the priority of Jesus' life, he went off to a deserted place. He climbed up a mountain. He crossed over the lake. He gave time to prayer and intimacy with God. And from that, he discovered his purpose. And we must do the same in our ministry and leadership. I've written about this. Um, you, know, you won't be surprised to hear the title of the book, Hit the Ground Kneeling. And it's just a few thoughts on leadership. And I'd like to finish with reading you a very short passage from the book. And it's based around uh, Peter Weir's fabulous film, Gallipoli, which some of you may know. Um, Gallipoli, of course, was one of the horrors of the of the First World War, where thousands of young Australian soldiers were sent over the top to their, you know, almost certain death. So in the film, there's a scene where the officer who is in charge at the front line and who will himself have to lead the assault, he sits in his office, and of course his office in the film is not much more than a kind of hollow carved out of the mud of the trench. And on a wind-up gramophone, he listens to a piece of music. In the film, nothing is said. The camera just lingers on his face. We see him listening intently to the music. And in the way that film does, we are invited to read his thoughts. And for a few minutes, we get inside what it must be like, not just to be involved in that situation, but to lead others through it. Now, I suppose... You could see this as a kind of escapism, a way of avoiding reality by listening to the music, but I saw it differently. Here is a man in a position of terrible responsibility, following orders, but at the same time having to deliver costly orders to others. He sees the madness of it. He feels and holds the pain of it is trapped and constrained by the choices that others have made. He knows what he has to do, but he still looks beyond it. And amid the frightful inhumanity and degradation of trench warfare, he connects with a beauty that must have seemed unreachable, and yet at the same time is one of the few things worth seeking. And in those few moments of contemplation, he is able to compose himself and discover within himself the resources he needs to lead his men. What we see in the film is not the leadership itself, but someone discovering resources to lead by retreating to a place of stillness and contemplation. In the midst of the horror, he stops. And in stopping, is better able to carry out the responsibilities of his role. In those moments, he is Christ-like. And Christ bids us do the same.